Belisario Nieto from Progressive. Uh, yes, one of the things that you mentioned, uh, Jeremy and Carlos, about empowerment. Um, I, how, how do you find that empowerment? Because um, I try to imagine myself in, in, in Ghana and uh, those women taking part in, in, in those workshops. And I don't see that empowerment there, even though you, know, uh, you, you seem to be comfortable with that concept. Um, I'm just trying to uh, not, not question the whole methodology, because I, I welcome it. I used it uh, about 20 years ago myself. But do they uh, um, ask their question, uh, the women in Ghana, why in the first place they are poor? And understanding that, I think that's a very good point to start as empowerment. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Claire Hughes from ITAD. Um, just to follow up on that point about empowerment, I mean, I'd, I'd really like to hear a bit more about what is the evidence base for this argument that participatory statistics does translate into community empowerment. And if there is um, that evidence, then the, the next step is, well, this kind of approach, which is a research monitoring evaluation approach, it is actually part of a, a wider intervention for empowerment. So it, it's not a an extractive process, it's part of a, an, an empowerment intervention. And what what could we be doing? I mean, uh, Carlos mentioned the creation of data banks at the community level, but what else could we be doing to really strengthen that dimension of, of the approach? I think that's a, a, a key selling point of it. Um, a second question, um, sort of picking up on ideas about how do we get this into the mainstream? Um, uh, relates to value for money and to me in the current day and age we have to engage in that debate what is the the value for money how do we how does this approach enhance value for money of our interventions and again I'm just wondering what what evidence is out there and are there there hard figures that that can we can really put forward to to sell this approach thank you very much I think Nicola over this side and then over there so I'm gonna challenge the rapidity of the microphone movement at this point. Sorry about that. Uh, Nicola Jones at ODI. Uh, thanks very much, really interesting presentations. I'd just like to hear a bit about uh, your views on the limitations of the approach, particularly for dealing with sensitive issues, so for trying to understand uh, or unpack taboos, so for example around uh, sexual victimization um, or, or child protection abuses and whether you think that uh, this group-based work is effective or not. Uh, great question, Nicola, thanks. And now over this side, I think. Hi, um, thank you everyone for your presentations. Um, I'm Jennifer Schulte uh, with Plan International, working on uh, monitoring and evaluation of Because I'm a Girl campaign programs. My question actually follows on a bit. Um, the issue of child protection was just raised. Um, I'd, I'd like to learn more about examples of participatory stati uh, statistics approaches um, in research with children, research and program evaluation with children, um, both the kind of pros and cons of it. Thanks. Uh, oh. Okay, I'll take... Um, there's a final, a final question here and then go back to the panel from this round. Thanks. <laughs> Got two microphones bearing down on you. From um, Madeline Church from Safer World. Um, we, we, we do all our work uh, around conflict and security, really, and um, some of the issues around difficult issues around information and data are really very important in the way in which we approach any kind of... Um, data gathering and empowerment issues in the context of the work that we do. And so the, the, the issue about difficult, difficult issues is not just about taboo subjects, it's really about the nature of relationships and conflict in the kind of work that we do. So that's one question, whether this, I've been thinking about the participatory statistics approach for quite a long time actually in terms of our work and I'm still trying to get a kind of sense for myself about whether it's an appropriate um, approach. And this, but the second kind of related point is that I think that, I mean, I've been around for a long time in, in this business, but uh, I, don't, I don't see a great deal of evidence of people with statistical backgrounds and understanding 
in the organisations in which we work. And so, for instance, we don't have statisticians or anyone with statistics backgrounds working fundamentally in any of our offices. And actually, I think there's a point at which you get, you get to the stage where you go, I really understand this, but when I hit the statistics bit and I start to hear about inferences and sampling and you know, adjusting all the kind of, you know, throwing out the bits that don't quite fit in the middle. And, you know, you're going, oh, I I'm actually not, as a non-statistician, I don't really understand how that bit of the process works. And I think that's one of the big barriers to engaging with statistics in this, in this field for me. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go back to the panel at this point. So just to um, have a quick round before we lose the live stream. So Jeremy, do you want to kick off? Yeah. Yeah, this the fantastic questions and I think this is exactly the kind of debate we need to start in order to move this forward now because we we've, we've made some fairly um ambitious claims in the book which people in the room have uh, immediately started to pick holes in which is exactly the next step to actually <laughs> get this get this thing uh, get this thing running. Um, <coughs> I think it, it, the question of um, how much uh, a participatory statistics group session is empowering is, is a sort of a uh, is, is a continuum. You know, you, I, I think our, our feeling is that if you sit down in a room with people and encourage them to generate and analyze statistics, that in itself uh, gives them some agency. Okay. Now that may be far from what you want, and at the other end of the spectrum, you have methodologies like Reflect, which encourage groups to then form associations which can then challenge power holders and, <coughs> and claim their rights. Uh, so you've got that continuum and um, uh, the question is is in terms of trade-offs and where you where you feel comfortable, where we think we should, how far we should go on when we're supporting this kind of research. Um, perhaps if I take one more, mm -hmm. uh, one more point. Um, the one on you, um, difficult environments, sensitive subjects, yeah. conflict environments. I know you've worked on that. Yeah, so. I mean, w w there's one chapter in the book with, uh, by Caroline Moser and others, which, and, and I've done participatory research with Caroline on urban violence in Jamaica, and um, this is an this is an issue which uh, young people are very happy to talk about, um, and. Uh, there, are, there are some types of research where you use kind of third person, like the peer ethnography methodology, you use third person research with peers, which is then reported back uh, and discussed, so that you kind of build in an extra layer in terms of sensitivity. Um, with, with violence issues uh, in Jamaica, we people were just happy to categorize and estimate the incidence of violence and explain which types of violence were more are more important than others, and uh, talk about their relationship with the police and score their relationship with the police, which the police then did the s and sit down with the police. And of course, they discovered that the police were scared of them, and they were scared of the police, and mm -hmm. that started a, a discussion about how to move things forward. So I thought, I guess, um, uh, conflict and security is more is, is a case by case type of approach. But certainly, we, we've we've got enough um, we've got enough emerging evidence that this type of approach can be used uh, uh, sensitively and pot with potential transformative impacts. I think we'll probably leave it at that. Yeah. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Yeah. Carlos, do you want mm. to go next? Thank you. Um, on the empowering issue, I, I do not claim that the participatory statistics would necessarily empower, and I think Neil really hit it on the, on the head when, when he said, the Malawi study seems to me like a reasonable evaluation, useful, but n not much participation there, mm -hmm. and that is absolutely the case. Uh, the, 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 we took advantage of a participatory tool to tackle a difficult problem, and that was as, as participatory as it got, which is on the extreme of non-participatory. And so, so <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the fact I is that there is no direct link between what we are labeling, and you will see the diversity of, of cases in, in the book, participatory statistics and empowerment. I think the empowerment comes from participation. <laughs> and, and, and there, I, I think we would agree. The second is the empowerment comes because we enable people to use numerical information that they that is theirs, and there will be a little bit of empowerment from that. Um, on the conflict, Please do not use participatory processes of anything in Guatemala in the 19, late 1980s and 1990s. 
but but then that is participation <laughs> as well. So it's, uh, and participatory statistics would have been um, death sentences uh, in in those situations. You don't need, need me to tell you that. Uh, on the issue of we do not have enough skills to deal with this, I absolutely agree. We are trying to train more people, but but it, you see, there's a those who are good with numbers are particularly bad with what uh, we are interested in, and <laughs> and and so I think this. The one of the real benefits of this experiment has been bringing together people from different disciplines and creating bridges, and particularly creating common languages. When, when you say generalization, and I say generalization, we don't mean the same thing. We need to continue working together to, to enable that. That will be my answer to it. Thanks very much, Carlos. Claire. You. OK, I've got my own here. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, let me just confine myself to just maybe two. Um, on value for money, um, the one of the things that, that we're doing um, in this area very much speaks, it comes exactly out of a value for money discussion, which is about not so much the for money bit, but the value bit, and how one can use a more an approach which is much more informed by some of the sort of traditions of participatory research to define the value that one is trying to achieve for the money. Um, and that's very much the um, the project that I talked about that we um, where we're looking at how one might translate some of the methodologies across from the health sector into development is very much about that the health that the methodology that is used in the health sector is the one which is used by is one of the inputs into the decisions that are made by the National Institute of Clinical Excellence where they decide whether or not a particular new health intervention represents value for money and the way that they measure value in that equation is partly determined by a sort of set of social values that have come out of a process of participatory um, sort of focus group research followed by a questionnaire that draws on those insights um, and the questionnaire that is built up from that participatory uh, research is then used to um, to derive a set of numbers essentially of weights to attach to different possible outcomes and that its weighting is then applied to the outcome from any particular new treatment or whatever and it's exactly that kind of approach that we're thinking about in terms of how that could be used to uh, how that could be translated across to development outcomes to in a sense make sure that the value in the value for money is informed much more by um, by what people want and how people define Im the improvements that they want and how they would rank and value and prioritize different outcomes. So that's, you know, it speaks exactly to that value for money um, approach and that's very much where it comes from. On the issue about, <laughs> following on from Carlos's comment, on the issue about sort of, in a sense, our own empowerment to be able to, to tackle these questions, I think that is a real issue. Um, but I, d I mean, I think that is a real issue and I shouldn't underestimate the... Um, the technical complexity of some of these things, but I also think a lot of these things aren't as difficult as they appear, and there is a sort of fear of numbers that is endemic among social scientists, which we kind of all need to get over as well. <laughs> Neil, you may wish to comment. On that. <laughs> uh, well, I would Thank like you. to comment a little bit just at this point about skills, um, and maybe just with reference to the Philippines example, where as I understand it, you know, the analysis wasn't of statistic, it wasn't about generating statistics, but it was analyzing statistics in a sort of participatory way. And it was actually quite a sophisticated analysis, I thought, in terms of looking at you know, where, you know, where are the accidents, and what is the nature of morbidity and uh, mortality, and mapping that against where actually services are provided to see if they match. And my understanding is this is a mixture within the group of stakeholders and health workers, but I think there's also technical assistance, and it doesn't say it in the in, these, in, in the book, but I, my guess is it's the technical assistance people who probably brought that sophisticated analytical framework that seems to be allying that with people who've got an interest in the questions that were being looked at as you know, a, a really good way of working and, in a sense, you know, re re really involving people and using the analysis in a helpful way. Thank you very much, Neil. Robert? Well, um, in that particular case, there may have been technical assistance in the sense of there were people who were facilitating it, but they were Filipinos. Um, I, I, I know, I know some of them. Three quick points. One about empowerment. That my impression, and Dee might want to say something about this later in relation to measuring empowerment, ask them, um, is that when people um, 
go through these forms of analysis which generate statistics, it is transformative for them as well in terms of their own awareness and in terms of their decisions about what they're going to do next. So um, it's in that sense, it's a, it's a, it's a, a very often, I think, a win-win. Um, the second one is about the standardization issue that you raised, Neil, which is a very, very important one. I think part of the key there is to spend plenty of time in the initial period identifying what the categories should be. So you need to, you need as a way, in, it, it's, it's successive approximation in terms of getting to the right categories, which will be valid and understood over a wide area. But that may take a, a bit of time. But having done that, then things should go fast. <coughs> and the last one was about um, comparisons. I think we need, um, we need research which compares what comes out of participatory processes with what comes out of uh, DHS and other, and, other, and other surveys. And unfortunately, where there have been big differences, there were in Uganda in the case which, which Carlos knows, which was um, the, there was a participatory approach with a sample of 200 and something out of um, a DHS survey. And the results were very different. But that needs probing. And, and I don't think that there have been enough cases of this. I mean, we, there really is a very, very important research agenda there. Um, and, and on the census, well, um, the work which Carlos did in the, in the early um, 2000s in, in Malawi found um, using participatory um, approaches and methods in 54 more or less representative communities generated um, a figure for the census which was 35% higher than the national one. And the census office, if I remember correctly, refused to discuss it, which maybe is an indicator of something. That's brilliant. Thanks very much. We're, um, the live stream event will stop now, but you're very welcome to stay and carry on discussing with the panel. I think the one question that wasn't picked up was on the use of these kinds of methods with children, which uh, there's a huge literature on. Just there's tons and tons of stuff on that. Mm. Um, and let me just finish by thanking the panel. It was really great contribution, so many thanks. Jeremy, can you take over the chair at this point for continuing?